Today we'll be looking at how to use joysticks and keyboards on the Spectrum Next using C. This is an overview of the main concepts. A more detailed written explanation is on my website, which is linked below. Also, compared to the other videos I've done, which went quite deep into the weeds on all the ins and outs of what's going on in the machine, this one's quite light. The joysticks and keyboards are very simple, and this is reflected in the code that we'll be using. So, with that in mind, let's begin. Joysticks on the Spectrum have always been a bit confusing. The original 48K Spectrum didn't have them. Instead, interfaces were connected to the expansion port on the back of the machine. The most popular was known as the Kempston interface. It gave you a whole one button and four directions. Well, it's not even much of an interface. There's a small bit of logic to know when the memory port for the stick is being read by the CPU. Then, the state of the switches is just latched onto the data bus. Joysticks from this time period are stupidly simple. I made a video about them. Watch it after this one if you're curious. They're all wired up the same way, using a standard that began all the way back on the Atari 2600. And this is fine, except when Amstrad came along with the CPC, and then Plus 2 and Plus 3 Spectrums, they decided to invent their own different wiring, but using the same plug, because why not? It was the Wild West of the 80s, and nothing was standard. Knowing what you can and can't plug into the next is quite important. You see, back in the day, this didn't really cause much confusion, because joysticks just ended up with two plugs on the end of their cable. One for the Sinclair port, one for everything else. But this can cause a problem for our next. You might buy a joystick advertised for the Spectrum, but it might actually be a Sinclair joystick rather than a Kempston one, so you've got to read it and know which one it is. If you own such a joystick, you'll find it might have two plugs on it, You'll see one of them is light grey. Never ever plug that in your Next. It's wired up differently, and you'll short out the power supply of the Next if you click one of the buttons. There's no protection on the Next ports, and it'll release the magic smoke from the FPGA, which can be quite upsetting. It's not the kind of thing you want to do to your brand new machine that you probably can't buy a replacement for. So know what you're plugging in the ports. Talking of joystick ports, the Next has got two, but the original Spectrum had one at most. And you might remember, if you had friends back in the day, that one of you had to use the keyboard whilst the other person got the luxury of a joystick. If that person was you, leave me a comment. What game were you playing? And was it better using a keyboard or a joystick? But the first port, which is the one on the left, is a Kempston joystick port by default. The right port, at least on my machine, is set up as the second Sinclair joystick. Communicating with the first joystick is easy. Z88DK has routines for it. The only difficult part is knowing what the functions are called. They're not listed, but if you've used Z88DK for a bit, you've probably got quite good at searching through its files looking for stuff that's interesting. You'll find the joystick things. The Kempston one is called InStick Kempston. There's also InStick Sinclair 1 and InStick Sinclair 2. Communicating with the second stick is equally easy if we know what it's been configured as. But knowing what it's been configured as can be difficult because the user can change it. You can configure what the joystick ports do inside the config screen of the next when it boots up. Either port can be changed to do a variety of things. You'll notice Mega Drive pads listed. We'll come to that in the future. I need to find a Mega Drive pad first. I've got some somewhere. I last saw one in the back of my loft behind the Christmas rubbish, so I'll probably dig it out in a week or so. Making use of the joysticks is very easy. After reading its state using the appropriate function call, we have a small data structure and some C macros to get at the input we want using some basic bit manipulation. As programmers, we write our games to use that data structure. We don't really care what actual interface is being used. Z88DK has abstracted that away from us. What we can also do is tell the user they need a Kempston joystick, like literally write it on the screen as part of the game's instructions. Then we can just ignore everything else. Or we can go and find out ourselves by looking inside the peripheral one register, which is laid out like this on the screen. So that was joysticks. Let's look at the keyboard. This is equally simple. Remember, we're using a machine that was originally built to a cost, a very, very low cost, using as few components as possible. Now the Next can support a few different keyboards. 
but from our point of view, they're all the same. It doesn't matter whether you've got 48k dead flesh keyboard that you've dug out of a bin from a recycled machine, and 128k keyboard that you've harvested from some machine that you've got off eBay, a clone keyboard from one of the new modern clones, a PS2 keyboard that you had lying about, or you've got an official boxed real Next with its nice brand new keyboard. They are all identical. Now as a piece of hardware, the keyboard is exceptionally dumb. It's literally just the matrix of rows and columns, but the rows go into the ULA chip and become address lines, and the columns go on the data bus. So reading the keyboard involves reading from certain I.O. ports, which all they do is instruct the ULA to drive the relevant row, and then we can read the data bus to find out what buttons were pressed. That's it. Z88DK has its own way to read the keyboard, but this mostly involves scan codes in ASCII. It's mostly for reading text. Since we want to make games, and since the keyboard is so simple, we can write our own keyboard routines directly that look straight at the hardware. This code's a bit difficult to explain it, but all it does is reads each row of the keyboard, storing the values in some arrays. Then I've got some other code that looks in these arrays to find out what keys are pressed. I've used a lot of Boolean logic to remove any if statements that would otherwise be needed. So there aren't massive chains of, if you've pressed this key, and if you press this key, then do this. It's all just straight logic. Now, because that's easier shown to you as text instead of explained in a video, if you go on my website, all the code is there and it's all explained. So that's how to read the hardware, but the raw key states aren't much use alone. We need some sort of logic to know the difference between tapping a key, holding it down, or letting go of it. This is basic key debouncing logic that's common to most button input routines. To us, there's a difference between pressing a key, holding a key down, and letting go of a key. To the hardware, there's only a contact being made or a contact not being made, and a corresponding logic level that our code is reading. Here's some of the logic that I use. The idea behind it is to record the state of the whole keyboard every frame, and keep a copy of the previous frame state as well. That way I can compare what a key is doing now to what it was last frame. There's then some small basic logic that will tell us whether a key was pressed. So pressed means that last frame it wasn't held down, and this frame it is. Or we can find out if the key is held down. So last frame it was held down, and this frame it's also held down. So the user has got their finger on the button. Or we can work out if the key has just been released. So if last frame it was held down, but this frame it isn't, they've just let go of it. So that's how to use joysticks and keyboards in your games. It's not very difficult, really. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like the video, well, well done for sitting through this to the end. That kind of stubborn refusal to quit probably makes you an excellent programmer. You probably want to hit subscribe so you can watch more videos and sit through them all the way to the end. I've deliberately missed out Mega Drive pads and the mouse from this video because they need their own explanation. They work differently and they're something that not many games will use. It's also my way of saying that I couldn't figure out the mouse properly for this video. I tried, but I just couldn't work it out. It's a bit strange, and I think I might need to use interrupts to do it properly. It kind of works, but then doesn't work consistently. And the pointer sort of skids around the screen weirdly. So the next video will be about the tile map system on the next. Because we've got sprites, We've got inputs, I've done some basic maths. If we get tile maps working, I can make some sort of game, which is where I want to go. I was originally going to do one of these technical videos every other week, and in the in-between weeks, work on some longer project on the machine. So I need to start working on some sort of thing. So I'll see you next time. Goodbye.